to day three of .NET Comp 2017. Thanks for sticking with us, and we hope you've learned a lot. Join us for our next talk with Phil Japitsky on solid design patterns for mere models. So nice to meet you, Phil. Are you ready? Nice to meet you, too. All right. I'm take ready. it away. All right. I'm going to shut the camera down because uh, nobody cares about me. All righty. So, Maria, I'm sure you'll interrupt if uh, you can't see my screen, but uh, like Maria said, the title is Solid Design Patterns for Mirror Mortals. Uh, just a little bit about me. I am a consultant. I do agile coaching. I write books. I do Linda courses. I've got lots of initials, and I run a user group and a conference, so that's enough. So let's start off by taking a look at solid. And when I talk about solid, I mean the design principles, right, that Uncle Bob made so famous. And what I want to do is I want to just take you through them in more of a practical definition. So the single responsibility principle, you know, by definition, do one thing and do it well. And, you know, if you were a Boy Scout, you probably had hopefully not that bad of a Swiss Army knife. But, you know, the Swiss Army knife with 17 tools, and you can only get to two of them because your fingers weren't small enough if you didn't have the right fingernails. Well, how does this apply in software? Well, it's really easy for methods, classes, even projects sometimes to become dumping grounds for whatever you want to put in there, right? If you've got a line of, or if you've got a, a method that's 20, 30, 50, I have seen 5,000 line methods, the problem there isn't writing it, right? We, we spend most of our time as janitors in the software business, unfortunately, cleaning up other people's codes, a lot of times cleaning up our own code. And when you have these hodgepodge collections of things that, that a method is doing or a class is doing, it gets almost impossible to maintain, just like trying to get those nail clippers out of that Swiss Army knife. So what we want to think about when we're doing software is how short can we make methods? How small can we make classes? And the reason is very, very simple. If we have a method that will fit entirely on your screen without scrolling, you can read it. You can understand what it's doing, and you're less likely to just keep throwing stuff in there. Right. As a line from Alice's Restaurant, it's better to have one big pile of garbage and two little piles. So people tend to throw things in when they see bad code. If you've got a very short method, it's easier to read. It's self-documenting. And more importantly, you don't run the risk of side effects. As developers, we are very good at fixing that one thing we need to fix and testing that one thing we need to fix. But if you've got a method that's even just 100 lines, are you going to be able to test every single thing that that method does? And the answer is yes, you can, but you probably won't. So we want to keep things small, screen size or less, and no cheating by changing the font size in Visual Studio, and make sure that our methods and classes are very focused. Now, I have heard the argument against this that hey, if I have all these methods and classes, that's a lot of methods and classes. Yeah, and my answer to that is, so what? With the way Visual Studio has all that refactoring in, plus there's third-party tools like ReSharper and, and several others out there, that's not an issue, right? It's not going to slow you down or make you less productive. So short, focused methods, short or small, focused classes. All right, open, closed. Um, obviously, if you are doing a modification to your house, building a porch is a lot more, well, it's a lot easier than putting in a new basement or a new first floor in a two-story house. And when we look at software and what that means for us, if we have code that's working and it's in production and it's been tested using that largest test framework in the world, which is typically production, unfortunately. Don't modify it. Don't change it, right? If we want to introduce functionality, don't go changing things at work unless, of course, there's a bug. 
So what we want to build are classes that we can extend, but that we don't have to modify. One of the biggest problems that we see, and I saw this a lot when .NET first came out and a lot of non-object oriented developers came over to C Sharp and they're learning OO and they're like, great, I can have 17 child classes off of this. Well, then the problem is somebody goes and modifies one of those base classes and it breaks 15 other classes down the line. And we'll see patterns. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of patterns after we get done with solid uh, that help support these solid principles. The L is for Liskov substitution principle. The simple definition is derived classes can stand in for base classes. The way I look at this, I look at the taps in a bar. So if we were locked in and could not use these derived classes based on the beer class, then we would have these very specific taps. Now most bars do, at least they look like them, but you can just unscrew those tops and put a different brand in. So if they want to change out from a summer shandy to a winter something, I don't know, I'm not a beer aficionado, they don't have to replace the entire line, the entire tap, the CO system and everything else. So when we look at software, and this is going to lead right into dependency inversion as well, all these principles support each other. We really want to make sure that if we're coding, that we can substitute one class for another class without having to even know there's a difference. Uh, Bill just showed a great example of that. I'm sorry, it wasn't Bill. It was somebody earlier today showed a great example. They were doing some .NET core stuff and uh, couldn't remember his connection string or had an issue with his connection string. So he just swapped it out to the in-memory provider and the code didn't care. Right, It's all derived from the database provider and off to the races. And this leads to loose coupling, which we'll talk about much more as well. Interface segregation. So I was fortunate enough many years ago to get to go to Hawaii and go to Pearl Harbor. And I was in the fire control system of the USS Missouri, the battleship. And imagine all those dials on all four walls plus a center console full of dials and levers. This is the firing control system for the Missouri's big guns. Now the people who knew how to use them could shoot them and I, I you know I'm, I, I don't remember the exact distance but it was miles and could hit a very small target. They were very very accurate. Well the problem was that the first Gulf War, all the people who knew how to use this had retired. So the Navy said, eh, we'll just computerize it. Slap in a bunch of computers, and it'll work fine. Well, they were wildly inaccurate. And something that you don't want to be with a 17-inch gun is inaccurate. So they had to bring all these people back who had the, as we like to say in software, the tribal knowledge to teach the current people in the Navy how to use it. Well, we see this a lot in software. Uh, there are several classes in, especially in the early days of identity with ASP.NET, where IntelliSense would scroll to several pages. And you're like, which method do I use and which overload? So what we want to do is we want to make very fine-grained interfaces that only expose those things that the developers need. The less time we spend in analysis paralysis, the more code we can write. And for me, the most important one, although single responsibility is a close second, is dependency inversion. And I show a picture of a car because I think this is the easiest way to explain DI. For those of you that are watching online or maybe watching the recording later, I presume you probably have a car, um, at least have a driver's license, have driven before. And what I want to ask you is if you want to go in your car go to the movies, go to the store, go somewhere, do you have to drop your engine in that car, build the engine, attach it to the drive shaft, 
bolt on the tires and do all that work before you can go for a ride? And the answer, of course, is no, right? The car is there waiting for you. So as long as that vehicle subscribes to the iCar interface, you can drive it. And here's the advantage, having all of that stuff built for you, not even counting the time saver, I can drive and you can drive any vehicle that subscribes to the iCar interface. Now, there might be the iManual versus the iAutomatic differences, but at the end of the day, if it has a steering wheel, an accelerator, and a brake pedal, I'd like to think a turn signal. Um, as all my travels have shown, not many people use turn signals anyway, so we could probably drop that from the interface. But we have this ability to go from car to car to car. So I can drive my car, I can drive my wife's car, I could drive a rental car, I could borrow a friend's car. Back when I was a firefighter, I drove a truck, right? Or drove the ambulance. So how this applies to software, it's the same thing. Uh, to borrow a line from Steve Smith, new is glue, right? If I am newing something up, if I am building something, and then I'm going to use that something at the same time, I am now locked into that specific implementation. I am locked into my Honda Pilot and I cannot get in my wife's van and drive it because I am locked into this one physical instance. We had a situation many years ago, we we're building an e-commerce site and we had plugged in a, a certain credit card provider, right? They did, uh, address authentication, credit card purchases, refunds, those types of things. And we were very, very close to going live. And the CFO called me and said, hey, we have to switch providers uh, starting immediately. We have to drop the one we're using and go to the other one. And of course, I thought the company was going into business or something. No, it turns out that he had lost a golf match and um, had made a bet with the salesperson that we would switch. So we switched. And the problem was, we didn't use an abstraction. We coded directly against that credit card provider. And so we ended up fixing it by using a, an adapter pattern, which we'll, we'll get to shortly. But that was a perfect example of, we didn't depend on an abstraction and we almost crashed the project because of it. So that's just a quick rundown of solid. Uh, of course, we could spend an entire hour on Sala, but we have other things to get to. And there are some honorable mentions, if you will, things that I, I always want to talk about in the same breath when I talk about solid. And the first one is dry. Don't repeat yourself. And honestly, clipboard inheritance is an anti-pattern, right? And if you don't know what clipboard inheritance is, copy some code to the clipboard, paste it somewhere else, right? The problem you get into when you have multiple chunks of code that are the same code is I might remember to change one, but not the other. So now we've got some weird bugs. Bug report comes in and says, hey, this isn't working right. You go, nope. I know I changed that code. I know it works the way it's supposed to, but you've got these multiple instances. It just gets that much harder to maintain. Uh, there is a new feature in Visual Studio, at least in 2017. It might be in 2015 as well. But in the enterprise side, there is the code clone analysis. And it will actually go through and analyze your code to see how many times it finds code that is exactly the same, close to the same, or possibly the same. So it's a pretty nice little tool that you can use to get rid of some of those repeated chunks of code. And of course, the Boy Scout principle. When we inherit this 5,000 line method, it, nobody expects you to go in and clean it all up at once, right? That you've got to keep moving the ball forward and just spending your entire life removing technical debt isn't necessarily what's best for the business. But what we really need to concentrate on is make sure that you don't leave it any worse than it was and clean it up just a little. If you've got a bunch of code with no unit tests, make sure that the code that you're changing does have unit tests, right? Add some in and add a few more in for good measure. Then, of course, there's Yagni. You ain't going to need it, right? If you've got the money to 
to buy bathroom fixtures that are solid gold, the more power to you. But I've never had a customer ask me for that. And this is a problem as developers that, that we struggle with. I remember years ago, I had been asked by my boss. This is when I was doing an internship in college. And my boss had come up to me and said, I need a calculator function in this application so I can add numbers without leaving the application. Well, what did I hear as an engineering student? I heard calculator. What did he want? Just the ability to add some things from the application. So to make a short story long, I built a TI-35 calculator into the application when all they wanted was the add function. So now we have all this extra code in here that the customer didn't want and can potentially lead to additional defects. All right, finally, let's focus on separation of concerns. And this is a little different than single responsibility, but it's also very similar. So what we want to do with separation of concerns is not build a bathroom right in the middle of the kitchen. Uh, I don't know who thought of that. Um, to me, it's just a terrible, terrible idea. This is mixing your UI and your database logic all together. So obviously if we're doing single responsibility, we shouldn't have to worry about separation of concerns. But once you start munging different concerns together, then you run into problems where it gets messy to debug, it's hard to understand, and certainly will not perform optimally. All right, so that's enough of the theory. Let's talk about some design patterns. Uh, do we have any questions that we should answer? Or are we good? I'm guessing that's no. Okay. So let's get into design patterns. So why do we have design patterns? Why do we care? Uh, this is a quote from Phil Hack from many years ago that I got off of one of the alt.net discussion lists. And, and I think it's brilliant. And, and the reason I think it's brilliant is because we don't always do this. And sometimes we get so hung up in the task at hand. So Phil makes this great quote. The goal is not to bend developers to the will of some specific pattern, but to get them to think about their work and what they are doing. Now, I don't typically read slides like that, but that is such a great quote, especially the last part, to get them to think about their work and what they are doing. We often get blinders on. We have a specific task. We've known how to do it because we did it this certain way before, and we just heads down, start slinging code. But what I have to remind people all the time is programming is not a typing skill. Programming is a thinking skill. And we should really spend more time thinking than typing. Uh, that's one of the reasons why pair programming works so well, right? Because yes, you're sharing a keyboard, but you've got two people thinking about the same problem. So that's setting the stage. What are design patterns? So, oh, I left the animation in, I apologize. General reusable solutions to a common problem. And we get, let me get this next one up here too, because I think conceptual is very important. There are companies who will try and sell you prepackaged design patterns. By our code, it's this pattern, or it's a strategy pattern, or it's a command pattern. The problem with that is you're buying their solution to their problem. If we go out of the software world and talk about what a design pattern might be, let's, let's think about buildings. Everybody understands buildings. And I've got two rooms, and I have an egress between those two rooms. And I would like to close that off. Well, we could call a door a design pattern, right? And there's going to be some different features that we need to think about before we get into implementation details. Um, is it permanently closed off or is it temporarily closed off? Well, it's temporary. That means it's probably a door. If it's permanent, it's probably a wall. Does it have to be fireproof? Does it have to be soundproof? Does it have to be see-through, right? So now we're getting into some implementation details. And at the end of the day, we're going to make a door. And we're going to put a door in here, and it might be glass, it might be wood, it might be a fire door. 
It might be a screen door. So there's a design pattern. I've got two rooms with a hole in between it. I need to temporarily close it off with being able to open up again. So then we start thinking about how we do this in software. Uh, by definition, the academics say it's defined by a purpose and a structure. I just throw that in because there is an academic definition, but I like to focus more on the practical definition. But here's another great feature of design patterns. It's a method of communication. So when I have a team and I'm, I'm doing coaching or I'm doing architecture work at a customer and we're looking at uh, the backlog and we're doing refinement, one of the things that I do not do, because I'm guilty of this as much as anybody else, is I do not let anybody pick up a whiteboard marker. It's best if you're not even near a whiteboard because once you start drawing things, now you start getting into nitty gritty detail oriented implementations and we're really just trying to talk high level at this point so if we can just back up off of the ones and zeros and look for the red lady or the the, the lady in the red dress through the ones and zeros uh, you know to throw in a gratuitous matrix reference then we can communicate better without getting lost in the weeds i was many years ago before we had internet everywhere and cell phones and international plans. I had taken a, a vacation with my my wife and my parents to France. And I had uh, one of my, my developers had called me, you know, and you can imagine back then it was costing, you know, hundreds of dollars a minute, not really, but a lot to talk. Uh, there was a production issue. She didn't understand how I'd implemented a series of code. And I said, oh, well, that particular block is a strategy pattern. And she stopped for a couple seconds and said, oh, I got it. Thanks. Bye. And she was able to understand my motivation and how I implemented it just through that communication. Lastly, the need to support solid development. If they don't support the, the solid principles we talked about, we're really looking at anti-patterns. Clipboard inheritance is an anti-pattern, right? And once again, not code, right? Not actual implementation. Code is a result of using the design pattern to analyze the problem, but it's not the design pattern itself. Gang of Four broke it up into three different types of design patterns. And, and these classifications make sense. We've got creational, uh, for example, the singleton, the factories, the prototype pattern. Uh, and that's how we create things, very obviously named. Structural is composition and relationship. So the three that we're going to look at, adapter, facade, and decorator. And then lastly, behavioral, which deals with responsibilities and communication between objects. Uh, we probably will not have time to hit all of these. We had a little bit of a late start, and I want to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, but certainly the command pattern strategy, observer and pub sub, we can throw together. Um, with some asterisks, we'll get to that. And Memento and Template Method are some examples. So the code that you will be able to download, and I'm, I'm not entirely sure where they're going to post it, I will give you a link to the code in my GitHub repo. I've got examples of all these patterns, so even if we run out of time, there's examples. But again, like I said, that is not the definition of the pattern, and it's just my particular implementation that I did for this talk. So let's get into some more details oh, on the creation. Oh, before we go in, we have a oh, quick yes. question. Do you mind? Sure. Uh, no. So a question from Scotty. How do you clearly define the responsibilities for SRP? Sometimes I group a bunch of smaller tasks into a single task responsibility for a class, but sometimes I break them out. Are there any guidance on how much a single class should be doing? So guidance, no. Um, I, I can put on my architect hat and say it depends uh, that's but that's a very snarky response <laughs> um, really it's if you start looking at your code and you start realizing that you probably need to add comments or you're straying a bit from the goal then I think you've done too much okay um, I, I personally find comments to be fairly evil 
because people tend to comment about how and not why, and then the comments go out of date. So here's what, what I would think is I would err on the side of separating more because, again, with the refactoring tools and the search capabilities within Visual Studio and other modern IDEs, um, it's not a problem if you have 25 classes. It's certainly not a performance issue, and it's not a developer issue because we can refactor and move around so quickly. So, no, there's no real hard and fast guidance about that. Um, but the more you can, can narrow it down, probably the better. Okay. And then as you get experience, um, you'll kind of find that balance. All right. Thank you. Any other questions before we go on? Or yep. That's it for okay. now. All right. So when we talk about the creational, uh, Singleton evokes the most religious debate ever. Um, it is also probably the most often used pattern because it's easy. Uh, but the definition of singleton is that there is only one instance and never any more um, with a single access point within an application. Uh, I, I tend to define it also as you don't have to have an instance, but there can't be more than one. Uh, there's some factories. The simple factory, which, um, in my fact, Bill Wagner just showed, pretty much a simple factory when he was doing his uh, deck sorting thing. A lot of times it'll look like a case statement and a switch because that's exactly what it is. I mean, it's not a true pattern um, according to the Gang of Four, but it is very, very useful to cut down on repeated code. Factory method goes up to the next level. We're actually using methods to create objects without specifying the exact class. And then we have the abstract factory, which takes a group of factories with a common theme. And we'll see all this in code. So I'm going to kind of blow through some of these definitions so we have time to get into the code. Oh, and a prototype, which I probably won't cover today, uh, clones an instance to make more instances. This is usually done for performance reasons. If something is very expensive to create, for example, maybe the DB context, and you want to have more of those, like maybe in a DB context pool, like we got in .NET Core 2.0, uh, then maybe we're going to clone it instead of just create more with file new. Or not file new, but new. All right, structural. These are wicked awesome. Um, I use these a lot. The problem is sometimes that uh, we learn about a new pattern that becomes our hammer, and then everything is a nail. So we often joke that everybody's favorite pattern is the one they just learned. So we have to kind of watch out for that. But the adapter and the facade... Uh, basically, uh, if we think of three-prong plugs and two-prong outlets, like I don't know if anybody on the call is old enough to remember the two-prong outlets because I don't think they seem to make them anymore. But when I was a kid, all the, prong, all the outlets in the house were two prongs. Dad would come home with something that had three prongs, so we did what every other kid did if we broke off that third prong. But what we should really do is use an adapter to make it so that the two-prong outlet looks like a three-prong outlet so that we can plug things in seamlessly. Facade makes a bunch of different calls look like a simplified single call. Think of it as an adapter for multiple different systems. And the decorator lets us change responsibilities at runtime. Sorry, hit the wrong key. And we'll see that in code as well. Let's get into behavior. Now I'm going to start to rush through these just so we can get into the code. Uh, the command pattern is super easy. If you think of your remote control uh, for your TV, where you have a button that says DVR. Nope, bad choice, DVD. And you don't have one button for every single manufacturer of DVD out there. Uh, strategy. And observer pops up here. You know what? Let's just blow through this. The only other slide I want to cover is this one. Sometimes the observer and pub sub are grouped together. They are actually different in significant ways. With the observer, the sender and recipients know about each other, right? They are tied together like brothers. 
The pub sub, they are not known to each other. The publisher sends once in the pub sub and every subject receives. And in the observer, it's a one at a time send with direct communication. And the pub sub usually intermediary, you know, something in the middle is handling the filtering and the routing. Now, I'm not going to necessarily get too deep in any of these. Again, I've got the code samples out there. Um, I do want to point you to some resources before we jump into code. And, of course, there's the Gang of Four book, which everybody should own, but you don't necessarily have to read. No, I'm sorry. That's being snarky. Uh, everybody who wants to be an architect has to have one on their desk. Uh, no, it is an awesome book, but it's sometimes hard to read because it is a little old. Uh, my actually favorite book on design patterns is called Head First Design Patterns. Um, and that is um, Freeman, Robson, Bates, and Sierra. And it's the Head First series, but this one's on design patterns. It's in Java, but that's okay. Um, it looks just like C Sharp. And actually, several of my samples came right from that. And then also on Channel 9, uh, Robert Green and I did a uh, couple days of recording. We did eight series or eight videos on each of these design patterns going down into the nitty gritty details. And you can either search my name or uh, look at that link right there, and it'll take you to the first one of the series. All right, so now we're going into the code. Let me just throw up this slide that has my contact information. I think it's probably online as well with the .NET Conf, um, but I am schematic as much as I could get that domain, uh, as in snow ski and paramedic, not like database schematic. So there's my email. I've got a bunch of courses and books. Uh, the code for this and the slide deck for this, you can just go to github.com slash schematic slash presentations and then look for patterns. You don't need the full URL. You just need schematic slash presentations. So that's the end of the slideshow. We're going to jump into code now. But before I do that, do we have questions? I'm guessing that's a no. Okay. So let me throw up the singleton first. And um, it, we had a, a rather colorful discussion about this on the, the Channel 9 chat window. Um, people are very opinionated about this. I am not saying that this is the right way to do it. Uh, this is a way that Patterns and Practices from Microsoft has recommended it. Of course, that was a few years back. This is just one way. But what we want the singleton class to do is only ever have one instance and no more than one. So when we create it, we have a private constructor, so it can only create itself. We then have this static private variable by convention, usually called instance. And then we have an object that we use for locking. So when somebody calls the instance property, if the instance is not null, it just gets returned. We've already created one. We're just going to throw it back there. The only issue that we need to think about is what if it doesn't exist? So then we throw a lock. We then check for if it's still null, then we do. We create a new singleton, and then we return it. The reason we have this check in here is... Two threads could get past line 39, and first one to line 41 goes in. Second one is waiting because it's locked out. So thread one hits 43, it's null, creates a new instance, and it gets returned. Second thread now, once it leaves this lock block, then comes in. If we weren't checking, then we would have more than one. So that just ensures the single instance all right next we want to talk about the factories so let's look at a simple factory and um, i am leveraging the pizza store example from head first design patterns because i think it's a great example um, just the way i do my samples and all of my talks and all of my courses is i never try and mirror real life I don't want to use a domain that people are familiar with because, for example, if this was banking, somebody would say, hey, that's not how you actually do double ledger accounting. And I'd probably say, you're right, because I don't know how to do that. So we have these silly little examples in here. But a simple factory 
looks amazingly like a switch statement. And we don't care if it's singleton or not, so it's just static. And we do a switch on the type and we return the pizza. Now what this is very useful for is replacing this in code. Because if we were writing some sort of point of sale application for a pizzeria, then we might have several places where we have to determine which type of pizza they're doing, whether it's the pricing side or whether it is the sales side or anything else. So we take this, we become more dry, and we have one place. If we want to now add a... Um, New York, Chicago, California, I don't know, Midwest style pizza, for example. Then we just add it in this one place and we're off to the races. We don't have to go find all those different instances. All right, let's look at the factory method. I know I'm kind of blowing through this, but I have, according to my watch, 17 minutes until we're going to be done. So we are racing time just a little bit. All right, so with the pizza store... I now have an abstract pizza store that has a particular method. And this method is create pizza. And we combine it with two different things. So the, the create pizza is our abstract, or I'm sorry, our factory method. This is where we're going to build that pizza, getting back an iPizza. So we're, we're coding to an interface. Um, we're using dependency injection everywhere we can. And then we will, in the New York pizza store, by default, create a New York style pizza. In the Chicago pizza store, we will, by default, create a Chicago style pizza. But, of course, that could be changed and overridden. But the other thing I want to point out, because we don't think we're going to have time to get into it, is right here is the template method pattern. And so we're going to talk about these at the same time just because we're in this code, even though it's not a creational. The template method pattern allows us to specify certain items always happen in order, at least in this example. So when you're ordering a pizza, you first have to make it, then you have to bake it, then you have to cut it and then box it. And if you do those things out of order, you could have a problem. So the template method says, all right, I am defining the order that these things will happen, but I'm letting my downstream or my descendant classes, or in this case, the pizza class, determine how it gets baked, cut, and boxed. So we kind of nailed two patterns with one there, but this is the abstract, or I keep saying abstract, I apologize, because it is abstract typically, but the factory method so every pizza store has this create pizza the calling code doesn't know necessarily what kind of pizza it's going to get by default in this example it's based on the pizza store itself all right so the abstract factory gets it, it's a, at least for me conceptually, it's a little hard to explain outside of any of their factories because for me, it's really all tied in together the factory method and the abstract factory, right? Because that's, that's typically how I see them used and typically how I have used them. So I have this pizza store, this abstract class, pizza store with abstract factory. And what we get here, instead of always creating the pizza based on the derived class, we actually have this factory that has all of these create pizza options, very similar, but can be different, that is now separate from the implementation of the derived classes. And that was way more words than I like to use when I describe something. So let's just look at one of these. So here we have the New York Pizza Store with Abstract Factory. I apologize for a naming convention. You know, the three hardest things in software development are naming conventions and off-by-one errors, and I'm not good at either of them. 
So here we got the New York Pizza Store with Abstract Factory. By default, we're going to create a New York Pizza Factory, but we could change that pizza factory to any other factory. So let's say that uh, New York and Chicago is in the World Series, and they have a bet that if you know whichever team wins, the other city has to sell. Like if New York wins then Chicago has to sell New York-style pizza for a week or a day or something like that, right? So by default, we would get the New York-style pizza, but we can also create this instance of the New York pizza store with any other pizza factory in there. So we're really taking all of the hard coding away and really using as much as we can interfaces and dependency injection. Any questions on those? That was just a whole lot of material I threw out there, but now we're down to 12 minutes, so I just want to make sure we cover it all. And I'm not hearing any questions, so let's just look at the prototype real quick. So prototype typically, like I said, is used when you have something that's expensive to create from scratch, and it's more efficient to clone. So in this particular case, again, just a silly example, I have a monster and I want to be able to make a flying monster or a swimming monster. It derives from the prototype, I wanna make a new one. I have this clone method. And this is very simple in .NET, I'm just doing a member-wise clone. Of course, there's lots of different ways you can do a clone. But that's typically in C Sharp, how you would do a prototype pattern. And that finishes off the creational patterns. So if we still don't have any questions, we will dive into the structural patterns, starting with the adapter. Actually, before we get into the adapter, let's look at what we have here for concrete objects. Let's say we've got a moose, we've got a bad guy, and we've got a flying squirrel. And they all have very unique properties. And what we want to do is we want to be able to treat these together as so the calling code doesn't care whether it's a moose, a bad guy, or a flying squirrel. We could certainly put these in an array list. And then every time we pull it out, check to see what the type is, and then act appropriately. But if we wanted to make everything fit this I character interface, where they only have three things that they can do, up to three things, chase, flee, and attack, then that's a lot of code that you have to write every time you want them to do an action. So what we really want to do is make an adapter. So let's take, for example, the moose adapter. And by the way, I just have to put out a caveat. There's lots of classes in each of these files. Uh, that's just a teaching technique. That is kind of a code smell and breaks single responsibility. We really want to have, as a C-sharp tenant, one class, one file. But again, this is teaching code, so I'm taking some liberties. But we should try and keep them separate. It's much easier to maintain and read. We so we actually have uh, three questions over here, Phil. Do you okay. have time for them? Yes. So we have a question from Anil. What patterns are useful in doing multi-threading programming? Um, async await. So I mean, that is a pattern, right? Yeah. Um, so the, I, I guess I don't really know what that question is because the patterns themselves aren't necessarily multi-threaded or, or threaded. The patterns are trying to solve a specific problem. For example, the adapter here is I have three things that don't look alike and I want to be able to treat them the same. Um, the decorator is I basically want to make the Starbucks point of sale system. So it doesn't have anything to do with threading. Uh, but in the .NET world, if you're going to do uh, non-blocking operations, then you want to look at the async await, which again is a pattern. Okay. Uh, the, second, the second question is from Ahmed. It is, are there any scenarios to combine more than one pattern for different categories for GANG of, of four, creational, structural, and behavioral? 
Um, certainly. I mean, if you look at any of the NBC, for example, is made up of multiple patterns in addition to you know, definition of model view controller. Um, I don't go into that in this talk. There's just not enough time. But any of these can, can be used together if it solves your particular problem at hand. Because remember, what we're trying to do with the design pattern is to find a common problem that other people have solved before and leverage the same thinking behind it. The code itself will be unique. But yeah, there's nothing to say that you can't combine these together. And actually, the Head First uh, Design Patterns book has a lot of really good examples of, they call them super patterns. Um, I don't know if that's the right name anymore. Um, but patterns that have multiple patterns in them. So yeah, absolutely, you should combine when it makes sense. OK. Um, we have another question from Scotty. Um, are there any creational patterns that can be applied for objects that, are, that, are need, that need extra initialization? Something like initialize async that can handle an extra initialization process, for example. So um, from a, I mean, OK, so there are hundreds of design patterns. and I don't pretend to know them all. Um, this list are the ones that, that I have seen and use or I have used myself. Um, so is there something out there that's specific towards that way? Uh, probably. You could find it. Uh, you might even be able to find an anti-pattern around it. But if you've got some heavy initialization code that has to be run, then, then I, would, I would seriously consider looking at the prototype pattern because that is designed for those cases where uh, you're, you know, creating a new object takes a significant amount of time and it's a significant amount of work. All right, great. All right, back to you, Phil. Okay, all right. So we've got the Moose adapter and the Moose adapter is going to implement the common interface that we want takes an instance of iMoose in a constructor, so we're passing a Moose in. And then what we do is we map those Moose-specific properties or methods to those common, more friendly properties and methods. And the advantage to doing this with an adapter that you create is you would have to write this code anyway. So if the script calls for a Rocky and Bullwinkle to flee, then you would have to know what that means for a moose and what that means for a flying squirrel. But if you're just using the moose adapter, then you just call the flee method, and all that work is done once. You know, a, a good tenant that, well, I think it's a good tenant, I live by it, is I will work very, very hard so I can be lazy down the road. And I don't mean negative lazy. Uh, if I only have to spend one section of time to really understand how these things map together, that's perfect because I don't want to have to do that each time. That's not moving the ball forward for my customer. So we have the Moose adapter, Flying Squirrel adapter. Do I do want to show you that Boris and Natasha, uh, they don't flee. So they throw an exception. So there's no requirement here that you have to implement every method of the common interface. You do what makes sense. Again, the whole goal is that I want to be able to, now by the way, there's unit tests around all of these. So I want to be able to loop through a list of these characters and treat them all as an I character, right? Without their specific without having to know their specific implementation details. So that's the adapter. Moving on to the facade. Well, let me just jump into, again, I know we're limited for time. What time is it? Oh, I have four minutes. Okay, real quick. We've got some uh, terrible APIs here. So we've got uh, called do something, do something else, do something again, and execute in method one. And we want to write code, not want to, we have to write code against this. So we are forced to learn these each time. What we want to do is we want to create a facade that is just the pieces that we need. For example, here we call it the I better API. And here are the methods that we need, friendly names, better parameter names. And then we will just wrap up 
all the bad stuff with the good stuff. So again, we don't have to keep looking at what these things mean. We can use interface segregation and just use the stuff that we do need in a much more friendly manner. All right, I have three minutes on my watch. Is that what you have too? Did I lose her? Well, I'm going to keep talking until they tell me to shut up then. All right. So the decorator, I think, is awesome. So I have this car, drives, attacks, and defends. And then let's say that the base car has a certain amount of hit points for each of those. And I want to put armor on it. But I also want to have an attack car, which might have guns. Or I might want to have a really fast car, um, like the Mach 5. So right there, I'm looking at four different classes that implement each of these as their individual class. Instead, what we can do is we can make a decorator. And the way we decorate that is, for example, here's an attack car. We pass in an I-car. It is an I-car itself. And so we, now we have this decorated car, and we will update those properties or decorate the properties with the specific things that we with the specific properties of that decorator. And the example they give in the um, the head first book is Starbucks. Well, they don't call it Starbucks because they would get in trouble, and hopefully I don't get in trouble. Uh, but it's a coffee shop. Now, can you imagine trying to write a point of sale system for all the different syrups and different special requests you could have? You wouldn't want to build a class for every single type and combination. You want to have something to say, oh, if you add this syrup, it's another 10 cents. If you add uh, another shot, it's another 55 cents. So you're using a decorator. And if I want to have this car armored twice, I could pass the car into the armored car decorator twice. And it'll just apply two rounds of armor plating, which increases the defend matrix, but it's going to slow it down by a factor of 40 if we do this twice. So that's the decorator. And at that, I am at 5 o'clock. I have not gotten into the behavior patterns. Did I lose Maria? We're right on time. Do uh, you want to wrap any? Uh, you want to start wrapping it up? Um. Yeah, let me just throw this slide back up. Go again. ahead. Yep, go ahead. And, um, you know, it, all the code is up there in GitHub. Uh, this slide deck is up there in GitHub. Um, actually, there's a lot longer version of this talk where I go into great detail. Um, but if you go back to, let's go back to this slide. Um, Channel 9, same property you're watching me on right now. Um, we've got you know, eight deep dives into mm. all these design patterns. I've also That's got a, what we kick off that series with uh, test driven development. So there's lots more information out there. And if you have any questions, again, here's my contact information. Hit me up on Twitter, send me an email, and um, check out the books. Perfect. Thank you so much, Phil, for taking time out of your day to share your knowledge about design patterns with us. Uh, and thank you, viewers, for sticking around with us in .NET Conf. Uh, we're going to take a quick short break as we get Bob Tabor um, going up to actually talk about async I wait. So it's perfect, you know, uh, uh, arc of content right there. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in a bit.